Seahawks fans, wherever you may be. Welcome back for another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. Join your host, Bill Alpstead, and co-host, sports writer and football analyst, Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Seahawks fans, welcome back to another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alpstead, sitting down again with co-host Keith Myers. We've made it to the preseason games, and then we're previewing the first preseason game, Seahawks at the Pittsburgh Steelers. Welcome in, Keith. Yeah, we have, we're have. we almost there. A um, couple days, we will be watching Seahawks football on our TVs. I, after this last off season, I can't wait. It's just we finally survived. Yeah, uh, it's been a, it's been a little bit of an off season, hasn't it? I mean, a lot of stuff has happened. This has been one of the most active off seasons in memory, um, and it and it started with you know us getting out of the uh, the regular season with the seven and whatever record seven and ten, and um, and then you know a month later we lost our franchise quarterback to a trade. Uh, with the Denver Broncos, everything kind of trajectory wise changed uh, in quick order there. The coaching staff turned over uh, entirely on the defensive side of the ball the year prior. It was the offensive side. So, really, in the last two years, the entire team is basically gone. Bobby Wagner's gone, KJ Wright's gone. Um, just so much has changed. And really, if you take a step back at it uh, objectively, I think that. More or less, the franchise, I think, has made some good decisions and headed in the in the proper direction. Um, the way things were going was a win-now mode, year by year, kind of unsustainable, and just seemingly getting just slightly less talented every year, even though they were trying to do that, you know, go out and buy players and, and trades and trade away draft picks and all that kind of stuff, and it just ended up not really working. So this is a, a reset and a chance to kind of remake the franchise have Pete Carroll do it again. A lot of people, whether you like him or not, um, whether you're in uh, favor of Pete Carroll staying along with John Schneider and retooling this whole thing, or whether you thought the wrong uh, person was retained by the franchise, it should have been Russell Wilson with Pete Carroll out. This is where we're at. Um, and I think it's actually a, a pretty decent uh, trajectory, Keith. Overall, what are your your impressions as we kind of head into this first game? Well, I mean, you, I think that, um, being that you haven't, we haven't seen them on the field and it's really easy to get caught up in all the fun stuff of, of, um, training camp and start to get excited. I think that we need to keep in mind that this is a team that's in the middle of, um, a rebuild. I mean, once you lose your, your quarterback, now they rebuilt fairly quickly on defense because there was some talent there and they were able to get the pieces that they needed. Um, but yeah, um, it's a, it's a situation where they don't have a quarterback yet. And so it just, we have to, I, I just want to make sure people are patient, let this play out because it's going to take another year. Um, I, I do expect them like this defense looks like it's going to be really good. I'm excited about that. Um, so, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, there's a lot to be excited about. Now there's going to be some individual performances all year long that are going to get us excited about not only maybe that game or, or that player, but the entire um, defensive side of the ball, I think is one that's going to coalesce together this year and really be set next year. Um, could be one of the best defenses this team's, uh, put on the field in, you know, probably six, seven, eight years. Um, Pittsburgh, I don't really want to spend too much time talking about the opponent, but Mike Tomlin comes in. I think he's one of the seasoned, if not the most seasoned uh, NFL coach behind Bill Belichick in the NFL. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's like, four, what is it, 16 years, 17 years, something like that. He's been there um, for, a, for a long time. It's weird to think yeah. that um, – you know, he's there. Mike Tomlin's not. Um, and Mike Tomlin's there. Uh, I mean, yeah. Ben Roethlisberger's um, gone. 
Yeah, sorry, I had that backwards. But yeah, I mean, he's he's been there forever. I've seen Pittsburgh fans grumble about it, but the truth is he's one of the best coaches in the NFL, um, clearly, and always has his team ready, has spent the last couple of years keeping them competitive and in the playoffs, even though the talent hasn't been there. Now Roethlisberger is gone. They're starting to reload. Um, they're in a very similar spot to where Seattle is. The defense is better than a rebuilding team should be, but mm-hmm. they've got nothing going at quarterback either. I mean, um, yes, they did draft, um, you know, a quarterback, but we'll see if Jimmy he, Pickett. yeah, yeah, it, it, where he's at and all of that. And then they, um, you know, also have a reclamation project. And so the two of them are competing. It's not a, it's not a, they're not in great shape. Kenny Pickett is one of those guys that looks like he's got a, he could probably start and be okay, but he's got a fairly low ceiling, um, you know, as far as his development goes. So they're in a very similar spot to Seattle, except for that they used a first round pick on a, on a quarterback and Seattle hasn't. So we'll see. Yeah, interesting. I mean, he mentioned the reclamation project in Trubisky, really kind of uh, second overall pick in the 2017 2017 draft, um, and really just underperformed um, in a in a bad system and a bad team in uh, Chicago. Um, spent an, an off season with the Buffalo Bills behind Josh Allen seemingly um, got better as a, as a quarterback, at least in the nuts and bolts part of the game. And we'll see if he goes into this and can earn that job. Now he's earned the right to start in the preseason game, but that's fairly meaningless at this point. Um, on the other side of the ball, Geno Smith has been named the starter of the first game. Uh, Pete Carroll's come out and said he's going to uh, give the start to Geno. Uh, this camp battle has been one we've been watching um, all off season here and into the first couple, two, three weeks of training camp. Drew Locke has done quite a bit of, of good things. Uh, all reports are he's on track. Uh, mm-hmm. There's nothing bad to report about him, but uh, failed yet to overtake um, completely Geno Smith in that spot. We'll see how this plays out. They're both going to get seem, plenty of chances. In it this does game. seem that he is, uh, that Drew Locke is gaining ground. Um on him because I know he, the idea was that he started way back of Geno Smith because Smith had been here, he had the respect of the teammates, and he knew the playbook. Um, and so he that Drew Locke was way back um, in that that competition. But at this point, it appears that he's gained a lot of that ground back, and it's a much closer battle than it was uh, maybe at the start of camp. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward. Both of them are going to get you know probably equal snaps or, or really darn close. I think Geno probably take the first half. Drew Locke, probably the second half, I would imagine. Um, it would surprise me if Gino went longer than that, at least in this no, first game. I, I don't think they're going to go longer. I think, if anything, it's going to be shorter. Um, you know, maybe have Gino get into the second quarter a little bit, bring Locke in. Locke will go before and after halftime into the third quarter and then let um, Jacob Eason come on and finish the game through the fourth quarter type of thing. Uh, I would... I would guess it's going to be more like that than it is having seen Gino all the way out past halftime. I don't know. I would. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, we're going to argue about this, but it's not really that big of a deal. But I would be hard pressed for somebody to come up and tell me that uh, Jacob Eason was going to get any time in this game. I just I just don't see it. I think the real battle is is between the two quarterbacks and the team wants every possible snap to be able to evaluate those guys. So I see it as kind of an equal thing, but J- Jacob Beeson can certainly come in and, and take over the fourth quarter for sure. Yeah, I just think you're not going to get an evaluation of either guy once you get into the third and fourth string offensive line. Um, you're not, you mean- Do we none have of the, a third and fourth string offensive line? I don't know if we go that deep, maybe second string. But yeah, I mean, well, you're going to even once the, um, like once the top four tackles are out yeah, and right, you're into right. you're into all of the undrafted free agents and you know journeymen that aren't gonna these guys that aren't gonna make the the, the roster when the season begins, um, when they're out playing, those snaps aren't great snaps for evaluating a quarterback. So, uh, so question for you: One of the things we're gonna do today in today's show is kind of um, tell you what we're what we're looking for. Um, what are you looking for out of this uh, these two quarterbacks in this game? Um, honestly, I want to see them not turn the ball over. 
but not be so afraid of taking chances that the offense doesn't work. They need to come out and execute the offense, string together some first downs, keep some drives alive. Um, they don't have to they don't have to play hero ball the way Russell Wilson used to, but they can't also be uh Charlie Whitehurst, where he was so afraid of everything that the offense just died uh when he came on. So um what do you expect to see um in this offense with these two quarterbacks that we haven't seen with Russell Wilson in in, in last year? I think you're gonna see a lot more short passes over the middle, hit hitting tight ends on little stop routes and and more crossing patterns and that kind of stuff. Because Wilson just didn't use the middle of the field. And it got to the point where they stopped running routes to the middle of the field because he wasn't going to throw it there anyway. Um, where I think both of these guys, especially uh, Locke, are going to, that's going to be their bread and butter, is that that short intermediate center in the middle of the field, um, you know, zone beaters. Um, and that's where we're going to see a lot more uh, stuff to the tight ends and a lot more of those quick, you know, six yard completions to a tight end over the middle or a running back, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, I agree. I totally agree. And I think uh, Pete Carroll essentially came out and said that, you know, with uh, regards to the running backs, um, that they would be more involved. And he's looking forward to seeing Ken Walker out there because that's mm -hmm. something that he's been developing in camp. Um, injuries continue to be an issue um for for a couple different position groups um specifically at the cornerback spot and then also at safety Sidney Jones has a concussion Trey Brown has yet to see the field coming back from a knee injury last year John Reed has a little groin Artie Burns now has a groin um I think there's one other one as well but you're going to see a lot of Kobe Bryant and um Tariq Woolen in this game and which is exciting I see no no problem with that um because both of those kids they're rookies they uh look like they're going to end up with significant playing time this season and i want them to get these reps just yeah. it's it's for them it's all about learning get out there get the reps um and you're playing against you know nfl receivers now so good luck with that um <laughs> yeah. the, these guys aren't college receivers anymore They'll, you'll find that the um uh the worst NFL receivers are better than the guys they were covering in college. So, um, and then again, they've both been playing against Seattle's receivers, which are pretty dang good too. So, um, well, Kobe Bryant's, you know, got into the, you know, close to the national championship, you know, in the final four, uh, best college football teams out there and was in that semifinal game. So he's had some good competition to go up against. Derek Woolen hasn't, but all indications are, He's really showing in camp and, mm -hmm. and more than just flashing. It's an everyday, really steady performance from him. And I would, at this point, it wouldn't shock me if he earns a starting position. You know, the, the, just in the last three or four practices, I guess Kobe Bryant has been taking slot snaps and, uh, with Woolen and then Artie Burns on, on one side and the other. Um, which is really intriguing to me. I uh, like that. I, I like seeing um, the idea of getting uh, Colby Bryant in the slot. I think he actually could um, do well there. His his profile uh, athletically actually uh, looks more like a slot corner. He's a little smaller, quicker, um, doesn't have the top end speed, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's why mm -hmm. we talk about him. He's, he was NFL ready on draft day, but maybe with a lower ceiling. Um, but as a slot corner, like he's like ready for that. So um, if that's the way to get your best cornerbacks on the field is to have him come in in the slot and, you know, or even if he ends up securing a starting spot, um, starting on the outside, but then when they go to the nickel, he slides inside. So Woolen can come up, you know, yeah. come in and, and have the boundary. Um that's a that's a fantastic uh like system for them and and great for the just get the talent on the field get the best players out there yeah i totally agree with you i think that we're going to get into a little bit of a conversation here in, in a few minutes too as we take a look at the depth chart that was released by the seahawks um earlier this week and um, when we get to this particular position group it's going to be and, and the safeties 
it's going to be evident that there's, there's some really good talented bubble players and this might be kind of a move to help diversify the the roster here to potentially either subtract or retain uh, certain players at, at mm-hmm. certain positions, and we'll talk about that. Uh, other injuries: Ryan Neal's out with a high ankle sprain. Sounds it sounded like it was it was going to be a bad, maybe three four weeks. I'm not sure about Ryan Neal right now. Jordan Brooks is out, and D. Eskridge are also out um, with little tweaks. D. Eskridge is almost back. He's going through walkthroughs, all that kind of stuff, but he hasn't run yet. Um, yeah, he's he's a guy that can't afford to be out and miss time. Mm, he missed. Yeah. I he feel missed, bad for the kid. He missed a lot of uh, training camp last year. That caused him to be behind. Then he missed a bunch of time during the season. It ended up being kind of a wasted rookie season for him. This is a guy that needs to stay healthy and get on the field. So that way the CX can get something out of that second round pick they used on him. Agreed. Um, hearing that Daryl Taylor has been virtually unstoppable, unblockable this summer, um, even with our, with our pretty decent tackles now. Um, and I'm really looking forward to watching him play on Sunday or not Sunday, Saturday, uh, Mm -hmm. late afternoon against Pittsburgh, because it'll be the first time I've really got a chance to see him kind of be able to explode against a real offensive line and, um, in a new kind of position for him. And so that's a really intriguing situation. Yeah. Oh, you know what? When we were talking about, um, the defensive backs, we missed a, um, a topic that would be, um, the Seahawks having a consultant, um, help helping Pete Carroll work with um, the young cornerback group. Yeah, yeah. His name is, is it Richard, a, fam- a, his a name familiar is Ri- name? His name is Richard Sherman. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, they they um, Sherman only played five games last year for Tampa. It's just thirty four <laughs> injuries have caught up with him. He seems to be accepting the fact that his playing days are probably done. Uh, so he came in, watched the guys work, and is talking with Pete Carroll about, you know, what they need, what they could do to, you know, here, emphasize this so that way they get better. Um, And he's taken a special interest in Tariq Woolen because, I mean, big cornerback with um, a ton of physical talent and uh, 6'3", 6'4". Former wide receiver. Former wide receiver, yeah. (laughs) Um, That form sounds a little bit like Tariq, oh no, that is Tariq Woolen. Sounds a little bit like Richard Sherman. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you've got um, he's got he'll have an interesting perspective, and I think that that's a um, kind of a fun little wrinkle is to have guys like that in. And then you've also seen guys like Cliff Averill and um, you know other guys that are in practice watching. You know, not necessarily there on a, on a consulting role the way Sherman was, but just. Um, they had a legends practice yesterday too. So a lot of them showed up yesterday, just yep. walking, walking around, milling around, talking, signing autographs, all that kind yep. of stuff too. KJ Wright was there. Yeah, Spe- it's, it, it is cool. Speaking of Richard Sherman, didn't he get a, a broadcasting gig for he this did. season? So he's, this he, is, maybe this is like a little uh, investigative journalism work for yep. him. Who knows? He's, um, he's going to be working with the um, Amazon prime, uh, streaming right. version. I was going to say yeah. I was going to say Sunday Night Football, but you're right. It's the Amazon Prime. Do you know which game that is? Which which game that's featured? Nope. I don't <laughs> either. Off the top of my head, I don't either. It's not the Thursday night. I think it might be one of the Sunday games or something like that. That's anyway. Um, all right. So a topic that I wanted to touch on before we really kind of get into what we want to see out of you know quite a few different players each of us kind of probably brought in a little something for what we want to see. Let's, we can talk about that. But um, yesterday it came out that Roquan Smith, the, the, the pro bowl, all pro level uh, inside linebacker for the Chicago bears wasn't getting the contract that he was wanting an extension. He's got one year left on his deal. He's uh, apparently it's come down to a complete disrespect situation. He feels like he can no longer play for the team. He doesn't trust them, et cetera. He's asked for a trade um, Mm -hmm. from the Chicago Bears. Uh, My question is, should the Seahawks be looking at this guy? And if so, what would it take? What would it take to trade for him? 
Well, should they be? Yes. We're talking about a 25 year old um, guy who I believe was all pro last year. Um, and yeah. put him and Brooks beside each oh, other in, goodness, in the middle. Of, you've got, you've got, uh, I mean, that is the makings of a great uh, defense. Have, starting with those two guys as your middle linebackers um, in this three, four defense. I mean, that that's, that's scary. Good. And as much as like, I want to see Cody Barton go out there and, mm -hmm. you know, play his brains out and, and just be awesome. I He's still unproven. He's still a guy yeah. that. Well, we can trade Cody Cody Barton as part of a package and have him go show out for the Chicago Bears. <laughs> yeah, I'd be okay I mean. with that too. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think you still have the would, opportunity. You texted me something like um, Marquise Blair, uh, Cody Barton, and a mm -hmm. draft pick. Yeah, um, like a third rounder. Yeah, um, and I thought that you know if Blair is one of those guys that just because of talent around him and he's been uh, he hasn't been healthy and um you know he went from being a starter the last two years during for week one to being a, a fringe player this year and it's crazy but it's true and in the last year of his contract there's younger guys that you know are now kind of in line to take his spot so i mean the talent's obvious there but it's just as far as roster building maybe right. not the a chance for him to get it so having him and barton go and a you know, middle, you said a third, I was thinking like a fourth or fifth. Well, you'd have that, to, you'd but, have to, you'd have to resign him. You know, yeah. Raquan Smith is going to take, you know, $15 million easy, probably 15 million a year, plus a considerable amount of guaranteed money to, to come in now um, with the salary cap going up and all that kind of stuff, you know, and Jordan Brooks is going to want a contract well, um, you're, after you're next not, year. You're not paying a quarterback for the next few years. Correct. And that would be part of the equation that I think that you would factor in with this, certainly. Um, and I think that, that that would easily, easily, I believe, put the Seahawks as the num as probably the number one linebacker group in the NFL okay. um, when, when this would go down. And you would be paying your, your linebackers a ton of money, but it's not like Seattle hasn't done this before. Now, I'd feel a little bit more comfortable if we didn't have like the Jamal Adams contract stuck Actually, in this, in this I was going to bring that up when, cause I knew this was coming. What would, what about a trade of Smith and Jamal Adams straight across? Yeah. If Jamal Adams had been healthy the last couple of years, I think this would probably be a doable deal with Chicago, but I'm not so sure now that he's got that sort of value, especially given the contract that you would be trading. Yeah. But you're, You'd be trading for a contract that has, I mean, it was a four-year contract. The Seahawks have already burned two of those years. So it's a two-year contract. So you can get out of it um, fairly easily after a year if you're Chicago were. It's true. You know, and they they were just trying not to pay Smith because they didn't want to give him that that four- or five-year deal he wants. So it, it's actually a much shorter term for them. Um, and to get that flexibility back. And you're also talking about being able to sell it to the fans that, yeah, you're giving up an all pro, but you're getting one back. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, th that seems like a, a very workable, desirable situation to me. Um, even if you have and to sweeten, given the, the, sweeten the deal with like a fourth round pick or something um, in order yeah, to make it happen. I, I mean, that would be kind of crazy. And, and, but I hear you. And the reason that I think this might, that might work is just the regular, the, the rest of the roster. I mean, well, our, yeah, because you've got safeties and, and Marquise now Blair, really who we strong. already talked about, that puts him on the roster. But also um, Josh Jones, the former second round pick of the, um, mm -hmm. of the Packers that kind of has been out you know, kind of, you know, just never really developed into the guy they wanted has looked really good. He solidified himself as being the third, the third corner on the roster for sure. And I wouldn't, based on the fact uh, what I'm hearing from him um, and there's no injury situation with him is that um, I would feel very comfortable with him stepping into the strong safety role. He's mm -hmm. 220 pounds, like 6'1", 220, but he oh, runs yeah. very fast, like a free safety. So he'd be that perfect hybrid. Um, guy that we'd be looking for that can come up, play the run really effectively, and also drop back into coverage and play that too high stuff. So yeah, he's a guy that I think needs to get on the field based on, I mean, based on camp and everything. He has been, you know, the best safety out there most days in practice. Well, that's well, that's because Diggs and Adams have both been, you know, nursing injuries and 
getting veteran day so they're not out there as much um but more than blair more than amadi more than any of the other uh ryan neal um any of the other guys that have more experience and more time in seattle it's been him that's been out there you know looking like a starter and i having him there definitely would would make me consider dropping Adams and his contract yeah. in a way to get Smith and then take on a new contract because you're going to have to sign him. Yeah. And for those that are unfamiliar with Roquan Smith and you know, there's a few I'm sure out there, but um, most, most fans are familiar. He's a first round former draft pick out of um, Georgia and has just been probably if not the best, the second best middle linebacker in the game minus um, Bobby Wagner. And I think that's overtaken that at this point. Um, and then with Jamal Adams, you know, he's another injury away from not being able to complete a season or spending a considerable amount of time on IR and stuff. So I would certainly do that trade. I'm going to be a no brainer for, for the team, I think. And guaranteed, I guarantee this is the type of player, especially with Sean Desai now being in the Seahawks organization, former defensive coordinator of the Chicago bears last year, they're in on this deal. They They've are like be. inquiring. The agent has been called. They're f- trying to figure out what the compensation would look like. Uh, they're also they're, trying to figure out what, yeah, what the contract would look like because they're not exactly gonna complete the trade unless it unless there's a, a contract agreed upon. So they make sure yes. that they keep him. Yes. Um, yeah. So the best case scenario is this is quiet for a little while now. Like the, the request has been made, and then you hear nothing. That means the Seahawks are in it because. That's total John Schneider signature move right there. Just go in, mm-hmm. get it done. Don't you know? All of a sudden, you're announcing it, and like everyone's going. <sighs> okay, so um, let's round up this show with what we really want to see. We've talked about a couple of position groups already. Um, I'm interested to kind of find out what you're looking at as far as the offensive line is concerned. So, with the offensive line, um, really, what I want to see is both the rookies get a lot of snaps um and specifically a lot of run game snaps because they neither one of them has a lot of run game snaps in their history um Mm -hmm. coming from the you know the mike leach um air raid type situation where you've got guys that they know how to pass block and they're great at it but they need run blocking snaps i want to see them get a lot um i don't really care that much if the running game doesn't do a lot of great things because to me, it's more important that you get those guys, those reps so they can learn and get better. Um, And that's like the more important thing for me, the rest of the, um, the rest of the offensive line, I think is set and pretty solid. I mean, Phil Haynes is getting a lot of press and he's not even going to be a starter. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you might see Jake Curran who started at right tackle, um, move inside this season and become, you know, a right guard if Jackson ever gets hurt or anything like that, just because it's how do you get your best, you know, five guys on the field type of situation. Um, Yeah. I mean, I just, I want to see the rookies run block. I want to see them get those reps. And other than that, I don't just want them to get through the game without injury. Yeah. I'm interested to see uh, Austin Blythe at, at center. Um, just because I want to see him move around a little bit, see how athletic he is. Um, I want to see Stone Forsythe. I want to see Stone play on both sides. Um, just mm-hmm. to kind of see, like, we didn't really see him last year. I think he had, what, 15 snaps? Some yep. just barely in training camp and preseason last year. And so I want to see his development. Um, I'm looking oh, for... And go ahead. Dwayne, um, Dwayne Brown, uh, CX left tackle the last few years. Um been out there uh, as a free agent. See how the CX drafted a guy to replace him. But if you're thinking, oh, well, if somebody gets hurt, they can bring him in. He just signed a two-year deal with the Jets. So he's no longer a free agent, no longer out there. Two-year, $22 million. It's probably a one-year deal. Um, mm-hmm. But that's good because they, Becton, uh, Mika Becton was the guy that uh, was injured. Noah Fant looked like he was going to start at left tackle. It's likely now Noah Fant moves over to the right side and Dwayne Brown comes in on the left side. That's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, especially since uh, it was Fant's struggle exactly. that, that led the Seahawks to make the trade for Dwayne Brown. So, And that's then the it, injury. You know, the injury was was the big one right at the end there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I agree with your offensive line staff. 
Um, the other players, I mean, all of our rookies, really, except for Derek, uh, Tyreek Smith, are going to be uh, available in this game. So you're talking Charles Cross, Abe Lucas, Boye Mafe, which I'm really excited to see. Just see how much speed he's really got. Uh, Kobe Bryant, Tariq Woolen, we already talked about getting lots of play. And then Bo Melton and Derek Young at wide receiver, they're going to get a lot of snaps because I understand that Marquise Goodwin is not was probably not going to play in this game because he's yep. he's got a little tweak as well. Him and Eskridge are both um, and out. Swain, so Freddie, and get... Freddie Swain's out. Have, oh, yeah, that's right, too. Game. So you're yeah, going to see so, a lot of the two rookies. Yeah. And a lot of guys like uh, Cody Thompson, who yes, is, interested in that too. is fighting for a roster spot and doing everything he possibly can in training camp to earn one. Like, at this point, like, it's hard to leave him off the roster because he's doing – a lot of really good things in camp. Um, whereas, you know, a guy like Penny Hart made the roster last year and was on it, but has done a lot less in camp um, this year than he did last year. So we'll see how that, that all plays out. Both those guys will be available. I'll be very yeah. interested to see how they do. I'm seeing, I want to see the newcomers too, and Shelby Harris and Noah Fant. Shelby mm -hmm. Harris, defensive tackle, Noah Fant, the tight end. So that'll be, that'll be fun. Let's talk, uh, finish this thing out with, um, with, Maybe you got a couple of surprises on the depth chart that was released. Now you got to take these things with a grain of salt this time of the year. Yep. Um, and, and certainly these are, you know, in play and these aren't set at all, but they do give kind of a window into uh, what the team is thinking. Yeah, Maybe somewhat. light a fire under some, some of these players, a couple of these players to kind of well, motivate and then, them a little bit. And then there's also guys like rookies have a hard time getting uh, or, you know, have a hard time getting their name on, you know, the upper parts of the depth chart, uh, just because at this point they haven't earned it. Uh, now granted they'll earn it in the preseason and the rest of practices and everything, and they'll, they might be there week one, but at this, but to the coaches and to the other teammates, they leave it as, um, you know, nope, they're still the backup until they beat out the other guy. Right. And not, we're not handing it to them because you don't hand it to them and then take it away from them. Right. How in bad case in that point one? would be like Sidney Jones still sitting there as a, as a number one corner when he hasn't played for two weeks. Yeah. Um, or okay. Abe Lucas not being the number one right tackle. Yeah. But Pete did come out and say that Korean's still there. So, I mean, there's that. Um, Despite I the wanted to go. Lucas has been getting the first team reps in practice. Correct. Except for the last. <laughs> day i think Karen was back there um i did want to talk to you about some position groups so let's start on the offense i want to start at, you know everything you know quarterback and running back look pretty straightforward wide receiver is interesting to me uh the team has marquis goodwin listed as the number three wide receiver right now not completely re uh, surprised because he's a vet mm -hmm. but he's ahead of freddie swain and d eskridge which isn't a surprise on the depth chart the other note on the wide receiver is that Penny Hart was listed as the number six wide receiver. So he's the kind of the bubble guy. But that meant that like Aaron Fuller, Cody Thompson, Derek Young, Bo Melton, Kay Johnson, those guys are not even sniffing the 53-man uh, roster at this point in the process. Yeah, see, I don't know if that's even if that's even legit because you have um, – Marquise Goodwin might not make this roster. The listing him as the number three um, – is I entirely Pete Carroll came out and said that he was he's been one of the most impressive players in all of training camp, quote unquote. Yeah, I know, but he's also a 31 year old receiver that hasn't had a good year since 2017. Um, and so you're you're talking of so I just think that you you put him there because he's the vet and because you put him over the younger players. So if the younger players beat him out, great. Um, but the idea that he beat out a younger player. If, if, you know, you put uh D Eskridge third and, you know, Marquis Goodwin down lower and then, Oh, all of a sudden Goodwin beats him out. Um, you know, that says a lot about the younger player. Right. Um, and so you start with the, the veteran in that position until he's not in that position anymore. Um, and so I also think, you know, look at Cody Thompson, uh, I think he's done far more than Penny Hart. Yeah. Um, but Penny Hart's and, got that returnability that Cody Thompson doesn't have. I don't know. I, uh, I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I hear uh, once in a while I hear something about Cody or uh, Penny Hart, but I also hear tons of stuff about Thompson being like 
you had a great practice, had a great practice, consistent over and over again. Yep. So I'm not sure. And then Derek Young apparently is just exploding in practice on the scene, making plays all the time. And to, for him to be still buried is is curious to me. Um, I would think that he'd be up there, you know, at least right next to Penny Hart as far as being on the bubble. Um, but I am concerned a little bit because when you take a look at the roster, there's only so many positions. And you've got Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf, Freddie Swain, D. Eskridge. Those guys are making the team. So those four. And then you've got Marquise Goodwin, Penny Hart. Eh, 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 who knows? And then you've got guys Both like those Thompson, guys can... Tariq Young, and Bo Melton that you want to make the team. Yeah. I mean, they can't put, after the training camp that Tariq Young and Bo Melton are going to have, when it's all said and done, those guys aren't going to make it through the practice squad. Um, They're not. Situation. Well, Bo Melton's the one that probably can because his measurables, you know, he's 5'11". He's not like the, the fastest guy. He's a guy, and he, he he's hasn't really had four, the press. Three, eight, 40, Keith. Okay, he's faster than I thought he was. Um, but still, he's, you know, he's not big. He's not tall the way Derek Young is. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he's a guy that he also hasn't had the press that um, that Derek Young has. So I, my guess is you might be able to f- squeeze him through. He's very um, similar that, to, to the last year's K Johnson situation. Yeah. And K Johnson made it through to, um, you know, to the, the practice squad. And, you know, now he's battled. Cade Johnson looks like he's going to have to go to the practice squad again this year. Although he hasn't, he hasn't impressed what I expected him to. Because last year he was the undrafted free agent. So you're kind of, your expectations are low for that. And then when he exceeds expectations, you're like, oh, maybe they have something here. Um, but now he's a second year player. You expect him to take this big step forward. And it doesn't feel like he has. So Cade Johnson might be. Uh, disappointingly, um, you know, on the way out, mm-hmm. I, like I said, I could see Bo Melton squeezing through and, and ending up on the on the practice squad. I have a hard time thinking that uh, Derek Young will. Me too. So, so you're looking at, you know, if you keep the top four, um, and then if you keep Goodwin right as the number five, well, then you're 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 getting Derek Young in there as number six, and that means Cody Thompson's not making the roster, and that and Penny Thompson and Penny weird. Hart's not making the roster. Yeah, and I don't. Well, I don't really expect Penny. Hart I I know that. that. I know. I know. But inter- it's just interesting to me. Yeah. yeah, I think that that's probably the way it's going to go. Though it's probably going to be Lockett, Medcalf, Goodwin, Swain, Eskridge, Young. Yep. And that's although my, I am that would be my final. I'm curious if Eskridge makes it on he, the roster he and may not start on, the year on the pup list on some sort of injured list. Well, he's practiced, just, hasn't he? he? Well, he's walking through. They haven't cleared him yet. So he has yet to practice um, because unless I don't, he was, did he practice at first? I think he went if, through a couple of practices. Keith. Yeah. Then he's not eligible for the, the pup list. You have to be on the pup list before the first practice. Well, yeah. In order injured to qualify. Reserve then. So he'd be an in injured reserve maybe. Yep. Injured reserve. And they could take him off injured reserve after six weeks or eight weeks yeah, or whatever. Which may be the way year, that they do changing. this to, to get one of those younger guys on the roster here. Yep. Um, moving on, um, I wanted to make a quick note that Greg Island has switched positions from tackle to uh, offensive guard. So they've got that makes working sense. With, the, with the guards, and he's currently in the fourth guard spot over Shamarius Gilmore and Eric Wilson. Um, moving Gilmore, over to the... Him, him being over Shamarius Gilmore is a little surprising, if I'm being completely honest. I expected Gilmore to show well in camp and earn himself uh, a spot or at least be on the bubble. And the fact that um, Island moved inside and instantly overtook Mm -hmm. a guy like Gilmore. I find that very interesting. They really like Island. I mean, you know, but they like Phil Haynes more. And so Island's probably not going to make the roster because of that. Um, Phil Phil Haynes looks like, I mean, he, Pete Carroll was talking about him as a starter, even though there's not a there's not a starting job available to him. Which is great um, news for the Seahawks. That's a good problem to have because if Gabe Jackson or Lewis goes down, or if they fail to meet expectations, we slide Phil Haynes in, no problem, no drop off. Well, and you've also got the fact that Phil Haynes worked out at center last year quite a bit in practice, um, especially after the season began. Um, you know where they were waiting for Posick to get healthy. Uh, 
you know, essentially Haynes was the backup center. So maybe they figure out a way to have him become the starting center and uh, stick life on the bench. It's possible. It's possible. All right. Moving over to the defensive side, defensive tackle, Matt Godel is the third defensive tackle listed behind Al Woods and Brian Monet. That means in, at least as far as my roster construction is concerned, he makes the roster. Um, so that's an interesting thing. He's yeah, a but drafted got, guy out of somehow they've got Puna Tacoma. Ford at defensive end, which makes no sense. He's a nose tackle. Yeah, they've got Shelby Harris, Puna Ford, Quentin Jefferson, and LJ Collier at defensive end. And LJ Collier is not is probably not um he's probably starting the year on the injured reserve anywhere. Mm, he's playing right now, he's in practice. He's not gonna play in the game on True. Saturday. And Pete Carroll said that if he played baseball, he'd be having Tommy John surgery right now. That's true. That he did say that. Yeah. So I could see him not making it. Well, then Miles Adams would make it then maybe. Um, linebackers got a whole ton of linebackers. I mean, this is the most linebackers I've ever seen on this roster. Well, it's a 3-4 instead of a 4-3. Sure. You need more linebackers. And so, actually, that's one of the advantages of, of playing in the 3-4 is special teams, right? Because you're not going to see the big 300-pound guys running down the field to, to um, you know, cover a kickoff. But you will see linebackers out there. Um, and so being in a three, four means you have more linebackers on your roster, which tends to equal better special teams. So we're, I don't think that there was really any surprises here. Um, Tyree not, Smith though is right on the bubble there with like yeah. Tanner Muse and Vi Jones and, and those guys, but he Ianagbe, should be able to make it. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm butchering that name. Is Lying, third, Lia Bunawe? Sure. Lia Bunawe. Um, he's the, he is the third inside linebacker. He's yeah, I know. To be the, you were talking about this the other week of how devastating this, this middle linebacker thing is. This, this makes the case clearly to get, um, a guy like Rokon Smith well, to come in. But not if you have to get, not if you have to lose Cody Barton. I mean, if you're just making the case in terms of depth, right? Trading Cody Barton for Smith doesn't make the depth any better. It makes the overall talent better but the depth isn't better true but maybe you keep cody from... barton you keep cody barton and you let joel like bunawi go possibly yeah. or yeah. nick Ballor. i mean how long does nick Ballor last on this roster okay uh safety um the interesting thing about the the depth chart was the josh jones thing i think everybody's just not familiar with that name but i think everybody will be familiar with this name according to all reports out of training camp it wasn't the it wasn't necessarily the Josh Jones thing being the third safety as it was Marquise Blair being, being off the roster being currently. in a spot where he lo he looks like he's going to not make the roster yeah. according to that depth chart I, that is crazy yeah i have five five safeties making this roster and marquise blair is listed as the sixth safety right now um so i've got jamal adams quandre diggs josh jones ryan neal and ugo amadi um, making the roster. Um, and Ryan, Ryan Neal and Ugo Amadi bring versatility. They can both play corner as well, well as safety. Marquise Blair brings this brings the versatility too. The coach That's has been true. talking endlessly about him in that capacity. So. That's true. I mean, having him be behind Ryan Neal is the part, I guess, the part that's interesting because they both, I mean, uh, Blair is younger. They both are, um, I think they're both free agents after this year. Um, or maybe this Blair high ankle sprain with Ryan Neal could be something to to monitor, mm -hmm. and as it relates to Marquis Blair making the roster. One of those two guys, either Blair or Neal, will likely land on injured reserve with a hangnail, if not something more serious, like a high Seemingly. ankle sprain. And then you're still leaving guys like Bubba Bolden, Joey Blount, who I understand is really showing out, uh, Scott mm -hmm. Nelson, and Deontay Williams off the roster. Blount looks yeah. like a guy that's destined for the practice squad because they don't want to lose him, but he's not. There's too much above him talent-wise for him to yes. make the roster. Agreed. Um, and then the cornerback spot, um, there really isn't any issue except for the the back end with Justin Coleman, John Reed, Mike Jackson. Um, mm -hmm. And then you've got Trey Brown still un, unable to practice. So there's going to be something Trey Brown's going to start here. on the pup. Yeah, Trey something's got to happen because you got Artie Burns, Sidney Jones, Kobe Bryant, Tariq Woolen. Those are locked. Yeah, those and guys then, are all making it. 
and then you've got Justin Coleman, John Reed, Mike Jackson, Elijah Jones, you know, Trey Brown, a couple other guys. Um, so you've got, those... you've got two, you've got three guys that are capable of being on our roster and no positions available. So yeah. John Reed, Mike Jackson, Trey Brown, I don't know what's going to happen there. Um, Trey Brown's going to start on the pup. So I'm not, uh, like, cause he had, he's not close to returning. Um, and so he's <laughs> according to Pete Carroll, he's been close for three weeks. Yeah, he's not he's not that close. Um, he's not working out like he's not running and making. He's not cuts. running at full speed. They he's, they've said he's not running at full speed, which, which means, means he's, he's weeks away. He's weeks away, so he's going to start the season on the pup and and be a reinforcement that gets added week six um, when they need it, which is cool. Mm-hmm. So that really leaves Justin Coleman, Mike Jackson, John Reed. Um, fighting here's for where, one spot. And here's where we need to talk about, as far as Justin Coleman is concerned, the diversity that we mentioned earlier in the show about them playing Kobe Bryant in the slot yep. mm-hmm. and then Ugo Amadi and the whole Ryan Neal, Marquise Blair, you know, thing. And so how do you Justin massage? Justin Coleman does one thing. Right. He's a slot corner. You don't want him playing on the outside. Um, he's really good as a slot corner, or at least he used to be. We'll see. Um, but he does one thing, whereas Kobe Bryant can play both, right? Um, Trey Brown, when he's healthy, can play both. Um, yeah. You know, Ugo Amadi can play the slot and safety. Marquis Blair can play slot outside and safety, right? So you've got guys with a lot more versatility. Um, I have a, a right now. I mean, the fact that that Justin Coleman isn't showing out in practice every day mm-hmm. makes me question if he's going to make the roster. It really does. Yeah. So decisions will have to be made. One of Ugo Amadi, Justin Coleman, and likely Marquis Blair doesn't make this roster. I think that I would say it's most likely to be Justin Coleman wow. of those three. And you know, the, it's not like the 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 cornerback room is uh, heavy on experience. Um, and so that's, that would be an interesting choice. That would have Hence Richard Sherman coming in to help out with uh, <laughs> on the coaching staff. You got to have funny. some, wow. some experience to teach the kids. So true. yeah, that's true. Um, okay. That's it. Anything else you want to add to, uh, to, to what we're looking for on Saturday? I want to see these pass rushers get after the quarterback like crazy. Yeah. I want to see Daryl Taylor, Nuasu, Robinson, Mafe. um, And then also from the front side, you guys like Harris and um, Quentin Jefferson. These guys need to get after the quarterback. They need to make Mitchell Trubisky um, as uncomfortable as you possibly can. Uh, That's what I want to see. I really want to see. Because that's the thing. And Kenny Pickett too. Yeah, I mean every the um every year we talk about is there enough pass rush? Maybe the, it, it, this is the year where the pass rush breaks out and 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 is better. Um, let's see it happen. Let make all of our um, our confidence in in these guys like realistic. Come out and show me. Yeah, and I'm not sure what Pittsburgh's going to do for throwing out an offensive line there, but I don't think it really matters. It's it's really about can Seattle create pressure? I, I don't necessarily expect them to have sacks in this game. It's not a stat that I'm paying attention to. Pressures, hurries, mm-hmm. how are we affecting timing, all that kind of stuff. Are we giving our back end guys like Tariq Woolen and Kobe Bryant a chance to get their hands on the ball? Um, and so that's, I'm looking for that. I'm looking for those, the, the back end guys, the Kobe Bryant and Tariq Woolen to have some sort of an effect on this game. Um, turnovers have, have always, have, well, in the last three or four years, have been an issue for Seattle. Mm-hmm. Um, we've seen, you know, a player like uh, Diggs be one of the only ball hawks on the entire defense for yeah. two or three years now. And it'd be nice to add a couple. Um, and I'm hoping to see that. Yeah. And a lot of the reason why they haven't got that is because they haven't had a consistent pass rush. Um, it's a lot easier for the cornerbacks to get an interception if the quarterback is throwing off his back fit foot or throwing when he, you know, throwing the ball when he's falling down or, 
you know, being chased out of the pocket or and changing an angle. Across it. Yep. Yeah. All that, those, all that stuff. Those kind of things are what lead to interceptions down the field. And the CX haven't had the pass rush consistently enough to create those problems. And I want to see it happen. All right. Awesome. Fun show. I mean, mm -hmm. here we are, Keith. So the next show is going to be uh, early, early next week. We'll review this game, yep. give you an update on what everyone did, what, what everyone didn't do, what we saw, what we'd like to see for the next one. Um, so good to, good to be back here into our kind of almost regular season mode, if you will. We're getting there. We're getting there. Um, find Keith on Twitter at Myers NFL. You can find me at MWC Hawk. The show's at Hawks Playbook on Twitter. You can find us on your favorite podcast platform and YouTube. Hit that subscribe button and share it if you like it. Take care, guys. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. Seahawks Playbook Podcast listeners, thanks for joining us for another edition of the show. You can find us on Twitter. Bill is at NW Seahawk. Keith is at Myers NFL. And the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.